Hi everyone, welcome to episode 74 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. The aim of this podcast is to bring you insights from people with a wealth of knowledge and experience and my guest for episode 74, Martin Wells, certainly fits that bill. Martin is a serial entrepreneur with extensive experience as a founder, CTO, VP of product and VP of engineering, focused on building and growing digital products and services and having successfully founded and exited three different businesses. Some of the many highlights of Martin's career include founding Intercom, one of Australia's first internet service providers, managing a team of 45 as founder and CTO of Dot Communications, which was acquired by Clarity in 2007. He was the VP of product of chat service MIGME, where he helped grow the product to 50 million users. He was also the founder and CTO of Playcraft Labs, a high-performance HTML5 game engine with 15,000 developers, which was acquired by Mino Games in February 2013. Whilst at Mino Games, he was the lead engineer and CTO of Mino Monsters, an iOS and Android game achieving more than 15 million downloads and number one grossing rank in 22 countries. He now spends the majority of his time as an advisor to more than 30 companies, helping them to raise over $200 million in venture capital funding and assisting in 10 acquisitions. In this interview, we talk about the model for growth, deciding when to sell, the minimum viable customer, and how to focus on the right things. Without further ado, here is my interview with Martin Wells. Hi, Martin. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. G'day. Happy to be here. Uh, so for those people that may not be as familiar with you, do you want to share a little bit about your background and your story and uh, what got you here today? Uh, sure. Um, it's, it's, maybe it's a potentially a long story. Uh, you know, I think I was, started coding when I was 12 um, and it was really bad code. Um, I think at like 14, I, I, uh, somebody showed me the, um, the go-to statement in BASIC and my whole world changed. Um, but, you know, since then I've, I've you know, kind of always been a technical, technology-focused entrepreneur. Um, I started one of Australia's first ISPs um, and sold that. And then I kind of somewhat fell into um, uh, helping out a, a, a telco, Telstra, uh, with how they would you know, share and manage um, internet services at a wholesale level. Um, and I think it started out as like four weeks of kind of contract consulting work and, and four and a half years later, you know, I think we had 40 or 50 staff and had built a great business, um, essentially providing, you know, a platform for wholesale services to be, you know, managed and, and distributed and built and needed and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think it was used by, uh, you know, Telstra, Telstra Clear, AAPT, you know, we powered Dodo um, in its kind of first year of operations. Uh, so, you know, fantastic business. I think um, I, I would come away with that is I never want to run an enterprise software business, you know, again. Um, but, you know, it was it was fantastic and lots of fun. And we sold that to um, a listed company here in Australia. And then uh, I moved to Silicon Valley because that's where all the amazing stuff happened. Um, I think in 2007, I think it was. Um, you know, and, and had an amazing time there for the past 10 or 11 years. Um, I was lucky enough actually of... of a friend of mine, an Australian, said, hey, can you come around to this, you know, my mate's house and, uh, you know, help fix his blog, it's broken. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, it's, you know whatever, I'll, I'll um, stop over. And um, I got there and I fixed the blog and, and the guy said, uh, oh, look, you know, I really appreciate it, thanks very much. Every, anytime you come out to um, the US again, to California, you know, hey, stay at my house. Um, uh, the guy was Mike Arrington and the blog was TechCrunch. Uh, and, you know, that just provided, I was just lucky enough to get a, a, a great start in Silicon Valley, you know, um, sleeping on a, a, a blow-up air mattress, which I would, I would uh, push away at 8 a.m. And then Heather Hardy, the CEO of TechCrunch, would come in and take over, my, take over the office, right? So, you know, but that was, you know, working in um, uh, 44 James Avenue in Atherton. Uh, and, you know, as a part of that, um, there was a huge interest in Silicon Valley and, and what... Um, uh, what it meant for Australia and especially technology and it was, it was kind of the mecca and they really were setting the standard in, in um, that kind of growth. In 2007, um, to a certain extent coming into 2008, it was really the birth of Web 2.0 and, and uh, um, I think it would be best to say from a technology entrepreneur's stance, you know, we're back. 
um, the whole nuclear win is over, we're now building real businesses with real revenue. And so there was just such a sense of excitement and, um, and being a part of that, you know, in the heartland in um, uh, TechCrunch was just, you know, a fantastic opportunity. But along with that came a lot of great Australian entrepreneurs and some of them were me calling them up going, hey, I'm lonely, come, you know, come to Silicon Valley, it's all happening here. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those guys um, uh, came out and, you know, we worked together and we built stuff together and, uh, um, you know, Mick Levinskis and Phil and, and um, uh, yeah, you know, I could name like 20 people. And, and that, that gave us kind of the opportunity to form a bit of a group and we, we uh, started that with um, some of the impetus from Julia French, um, who later became my wife. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we started the Aussie Mafia. And, you know, that was just a, it was actually started out as a bit of a joke because we always, there was always the PayPal Mafia and um, all these other organizations and we thought, oh, you know, we should all get together and we'll have our own Mafia. And, um, and it was always a fun way for Australians to connect in the Valley. Uh, and then, let's see, I know this is a long answer to your, uh, your question about background. Um, I, you know, did a lot of work with a lot of great people in Silicon Valley, everything from, you know, um, starting out with Hadoop and um, helping some of the Facebook stuff there with Jeff Hammerbacker, who went on to found Cladera, um, and working at um, MIGME as their VP of product and, you know, helping Steve Go um, build an amazing business um, that I think probably raised 40 or $50 million and um, got, got, I think we were at one point we were doing about one and a half or two million new users a month. So just amazing experience to be able to be a part of that. Um, I remember they'd, they'd kind of drive down to desperately install more and more servers every day, right? Because it was just so hard to keep up with the growth. <laughs> um, and then I uh, started another company called Playcraft, which uh, built HTML5 game engine tools, um, which was pretty okay. It was okay. You know, I was kind of betting on the trend of HTML5 and um, I think at a TechCrunch Disrupt, um, towards the end of an interview, um, Mike Arrington asked Mark Zuckerberg, um, we, what was one of the great mistakes Facebook's made uh, in the past 12 months? And he said, HTML5. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was, I was like, oh. Um, but, you know, we built, we built a good business. And I think we got about 15,000 developers. We ended up getting a good, you know, um, acquisition offer from Nino and we took that and then I joined um, Mino Games and we built some, you know, amazing stuff and um, one of the games that we built got about 15 million downloads and um, went on to do great things. Uh, and then last couple of years, um, I, you know, switched over um, to doing what I really like doing, which is kind of being a technology entrepreneur, uh, but not having to actually do the work and have the stress. Um, which is, you know, a lot of advising, a lot of, you know, product management stuff on how, how do you build it, how do you make it successful, how do you scale it, how do you um, do that without losing all your hair and uh, wasting all your money, right? So doing that and working uh, very much with founders of founders, uh, which is really inspired by Julia French, who also brought TechCrunch Battlefield to Australia, which is just, you know, amazing to see that dream realised. Uh, but founders of founders is, is a mentor network where um, I think that we recognize that um, being a leader and building a company is an incredibly lonely exercise, right? No matter what you do, when you're in front and when you're leading, when you're, when you're going forward and forging a new path, you in, are inherently alone, even with a co-founder. And we wanted to find a way that founders would be able to connect on that level with each other and be able to um, communicate and share ideas and do that in a genuine way that's not polluted by service providers or um, you know, investors or, uh, and there's nothing wrong with any of those people, but um, you know, we wanted to create a network where um, they could do that. And Julia has assembled, you know, as I think only Julia could, um, a, a absolutely world-class, like representatives of just about every major company and um, outstanding, successful, um, multi-time entrepreneurs who are willing to give up their time. Um, and so, um, you know, I'd encourage anybody listening to go check it out, foundersforfounders.com, um, and, you know, join up. And um, one of the conditions is when you, when you join up, you have to mentor someone else, you know, when you get mentoring. Right? So, um, and... I guess last thing on background in my incredibly long answer to your short question was uh, 
I'm, I'm back in Australia and we probably spend probably 50% of our time in California and here um, with the intention of spending a lot more time here um, because it's just, you know, I'm Australian, right? And it's just so much more fun to be doing this with other Australians and the Australian marketplace is, you know, clearly an ascent. It's a huge amount of interest. Uh, has all the kind of firepower now to do great things uh, and it strikingly resembles 2007 um, in Silicon Valley. Um, so I think that there's, there's definitely some, maybe some cultural challenges, but um, it's just an amazing opportunity for Australia right now. And it's just a really fun place to be um, when you're a technology entrepreneur. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's, there's so much that I want to unpack, such as founder, founder, founders and some of the, the differences that you've seen uh, in the ecosystem since you left for, for San Fran as well. But um, just going back, you know, obviously, we're, at, we're doing this interview at uh, TechCrunch Battlefield. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, Julia and the team have done an incredible job in, in you know, bringing TechCrunch to Australia and, and putting this whole thing together. But one of the big things that strikes me about uh, an event like this is just the serendipity that it allows. And, uh, you know, just, again, kind of going back to some of the experiences that you have of helping out with a blog that, that ended up being TechCrunch, um, you know, how, how important is it for... Uh, for an ecosystem or for a community to, to create those sort of opportunities and, and how do you sort of foster that um, in the Australian startup ecosystem? Yeah, you know, I think um, Julia especially has a real knack for that um, and, you know, events are the bread and butter um, and then being able to filter, manage and not so much filter in terms of like who deserves to be in a place but filter in a way where the right kind of synergistic um, uh, relationships occur. So getting getting similar, f- you know, founder level in a room. Um, uh, so I think that's that's you know an important step, and I think that's happening um, in a great way already. Um, as to rate how important it is, um, you know, I think we we've got a balance of of you can definitely get event fatigue and just you know you can actually almost I've seen people get addicted to events. Yeah. Um, and even to a point where socially you know, all of their friends just go to events, right? Mm. And they just do this, you know, like two or three events a week, right? So I think you can definitely overkill. Um, but I, you know, I think it's bread and butter. Absolutely. And uh, so you've mentioned, I, I just interviewed Chris Saad as well, who also mentioned how, how similar the Australian startup ecosystem seems to be now compared to what Silicon Valley was like back in 07. Um, what, what is it specifically about the ecosystem that, uh, you know, attracts people like you to want to come back and, and be sort of involved in, and what is it that you think we can learn from uh, some of the, the lessons of what sort of took place 10, 10 years ago in Silicon Valley? Yeah, well, okay. <coughs> so, big, you know, big question. Coming back, <laughs> where it's sunny, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but like living in, in, um, in NorCal and San Francisco sucks, right? I mean, it's just not a great place to live. It's California and it's pretty warm. But, you know, there's pretty dense traffic. It's super expensive, um, though, I'm, you know, Sydney's pretty, pretty expensive. <laughs> Sydney's up um, You know, it's, it's incredibly tech-focused. Um, and I think that um, Sydney has a, a great many things going for it. Uh, and one of those things is lifestyle. Like people have other lives, and that's okay. And it actually um, provides a lot of opportunity to, you know, build on other things. Uh, I think that Silicon Valley... Um, as opposed to where it was in 2007, has become um, much more polarised and much more focused on its own growth engine. Uh, And there's kind of two effects of that. One is it's hugely dominated by the big five uh, and they're becoming more and more and more powerful, right? And they are definitely, you know, there's a squeeze on innovation and um, and that's, that's, you know, you might think in a healthy way. Certainly it would be considered a healthy way here. But, you know, when startups get traction, they often get acquired very early. And, and early is $30, $50 million. And they don't go on to become, you know, billion-dollar companies. Um, and, and you'll even get acquisitions that are focused just on the talent, you know, just on the team that was there, um, what you might call the aqua hire. Um, and so that, to a certain extent, cuts the, um, pulls the air out of it. Um, as things are kind of acorning and starting to grow and do new things. Um, I think that the opportunity is is shifting a little. Uh, you know, SaaS is a very difficult business to be in now. Uh, acquisition is just climbing and 
Um, the most of the major sectors are pretty well nailed, and so now we're, now we're sort of seeing the SaaS on SaaS business. Like there are actually tools that help you manage SaaS tools, right? Uh, and that's always an indicator that, of saturation. Um, I think that Australia, and what reminds me in terms of um, 2007 in the Valley is that optimism, that breadth of idea, um, you know, the stuff that Phil Moore's doing over at, in a main sequence and the CSIRO and, and how well that's being adopted, how, how um, broad the opportunities are is just super exciting um, and not focused on um, the um, very heavy mass growth, high growth um, um, way of doing things in the Valley. An example of that is if you wanted to build a business, you know, there's a certain model for growth, right? So you need to be able to effectively test your idea, um, get validation, um, launch, learn uh, as rapidly as possible. And, and, and we could talk for an hour about, you know, how that works and how that is incredibly effective. Um, but it does limit your focus to certain kinds of businesses, right? You're like, well, if I can't, if I can't really scale it and I can't get validation early... Um, you know, I can. I, I know entrepreneurs that would go through an idea a month at the speed that Australians would take a year, and they'd do it in a month, right? And they've tested some landing pages and you know blown out different ad types, and they've interviewed 400 people, and they've done surveys and questionnaires, and they've built prototypes, and they've, you know, it's all happening in four weeks, right? And they go, no, not going to do it. I can't scale it fast enough. I can't raise money on that. You know, there's no real growth opportunity in terms of trend or you know whatever else. Right? So um, I like Australia's you know, lack of that and also um, hate that, mm. you know, because I'm so used to that way of doing things, um, that translating that into Australia. Um, so I think that that breadth of, of um, opportunity exists here uh, and I think that we've still got a great amount of undiscovered country in terms of Australia, New Zealand, Asia um, and our accessibility to that, which, you know, we could talk about for ages as well. Sure. Uh, w- one of the things that you you touched on was uh, you know companies are getting acquired a lot earlier uh, than their potential potentially suggests. So uh, you know getting acquired for thirty to fifty million dollars when they have the potential to become billion dollar companies. Um, obviously, you've been on you know had to go through that yourself where you've exited companies. Um, what you know? How would uh, you recommend that founders? approach that sort of exit opportunity or what, what were some of the things that went through um, your head in terms of a decision making process of is this the right uh, right strategy for me to pursue or, or should I sort of persevere on with, with what it is that I'm doing? Yeah, you know um, incredibly difficult decision um, if you've got enough growth and validation to be an acquisition target um, then why would you sell? Because your business is just going to grow. Um, if you're selling because of risk, you know, that you think, well, this may not work out in the next couple of years, or something, anything could happen, right? Um, you know, then you've got a big problem with your business, and um, and that that's a very different thing to think about. Mm. Um, so I think that most of the time, um, selling, you know, is is about a lifestyle choice, you know, and. The VCs, by the way, in Silicon Valley are very aware of this. You know, if, you've got, if you approach someone <coughs> and say, uh, we'd like to put, your business is growing, it's worth um, $200 million, uh, and we'd like to invest $50 million, right? Or, or even, let's say, even smaller, right? Your business is doing $10 million in revenue, and you, know, um, you could maybe sell for $60 million, uh, and you've potentially got an acquisition offer there. And then the investor comes along, hey, says, I'll give you $25 million. You're like, why will I roll the dice, right? Because this is, is uh, life-changing for me to get $60 million. I mean, you're kidding, right? Not only will my life change, but, you know, generations to come of my family, everybody I know, the ecosystem I'm involved in, you know, it's earth-shattering in its impact. Right? So why would I, you're asking me to roll the dice again. Right. And it's like winning ten million a million dollars at the casino, and then they say put it all on black. Right? You're just like, are you insane? I'd never do that. So the the way that's handled in the valley, and to a certain extent more so here, um, as the rounds get larger, you take money off the table. Right? So they'll say we'll give you twenty five million dollars, but we'll give you seven, and you put seven in the bank, and the rest of it goes towards the company. And you know I can't think of you know many 
um, you know, large Series A's or B's, even the Australian companies where that's not happening, because you're alleviating that risk, right? Uh, I think that you know ultimately the decision comes down to um, the deal, right? And is it the right thing for the company? Is it going to grow faster? You know, what's the earn out like? Um, how, how much enthusiasm and, and firepower do you personally have left to throw at a business? Um, so I think you've got to weigh all those things up and figure out is it, is it the right step to, to do that. Sure. And, and obviously you, you touched on you've had several businesses that have grown really, really quickly. Uh, I think it's about three that got to about, uh, 50 million users. Um, well, one of them made... 50 million, another one got about 15 million. Sure. Um, so in terms of building and approaching product, especially when that's looking at a scalable product, what are, what are some of the, uh, again, some of the considerations that uh, developers or CTOs should have in terms of building a scalable product that is prepared for those sort of numbers of growth that you were mentioning, I think close to a million users a month is, is incredible. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, w- when it... When you're dealing with scale, um, everything breaks. And the great thing is that um, the the most sort of common, easiest mistake to make is to build for scale. Um, And so you kind of consider that and do that, but most of the time, uh, it's just not necessary. I mean, 99% of the time, just don't bother. because you'll have the opportunity to figure out scale. And nowadays we have so many tools and so much firepower to be able to bring to bear on a scale problem um, that, you know, and that actually includes you know, engineering and, um, you know, data management and deployment, servers and hosting, all that sort of stuff. Um, but also infrastructure and people. Right? Um, I, I, I have gotten calls from people who are like, hey, you know, holy crap, we're adding 10,000 users a day, what do we do, right? And it's, you know, madly on the phone, calling someone else, and the AWS will step in faster than you can, you know, count chickens um, to help out. And, you know, VCs will be calling straight away and, like, do you need a bridging round? And, like, there's just so much infrastructure to, like, to be there to support that. Um, so I would say don't. Don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Um, I think scale, building a scalable business model as a slightly different thing as opposed to technology and, and services, you know, are you building a business that can scale? Um, I would say there's, there's a really common mistake, which is to consider the scale of the market for a product and, and disqualify or try and build to that, you know, scale of market, breadth of market, right? maybe a better word, um, and kind of fail doing it because you're just not focused enough, right? And I think that my general rule is, <laughs> two things. Uh, usually, when I talk to you know entrepreneurs about product, um, they spend way too much time thinking about it and building something. It's, it's it's usually what people want is incredibly dumb. It's really simple. Just do that thing. Um, and usually, I, they get a surprise when I say, you know, when are you ready to launch? And they say, oh, well, you know, like four weeks, and right. Oh, the answer is always always four weeks. Right? <laughs> I'm like, cool. Let's launch in 24 hours, like tomorrow do whatever it takes, right? No, 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 you can't build anything. You know, yes, you can use Typeform and Wix and throw up a page and no, don't worry about that bit. You know, if people want to cancel their account, just have them, you know, click and it's a mail to link, right? Um, and I'm not saying go to town and launching this, you know, huge product to the world. I'm saying get it into people's hand because it's not minimum viable product, it's minimum viable customer. Uh, and being able to create that loop and get that feedback um, is, is just the, the highest priority thing. The second thing I'd say is um, your business as an entrepreneur is to make love. Uh, products that... I, li- I like that saying. Yeah. I, I haven't heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pro- you know, I find products that generate, that make like, don't work very well. And you're really, you know, gem hunting for this thing that people love. And they're like, bang, I get this. I, yep, I love it. Really, well, yeah, and you're done. And I would say it's the best, you know, part of the way the best to do that is to create incredible focus and like limiting the way you do that. So you're just getting this value prop uh, and you're putting it out there and, and finding a way that people love it. Um, and and f- focus the market, like you can limit it down. Like um, an example might be, you know, uh, okay, you want to, 
an Uber for um, old people. Um, th there's a, a segment of that market which might be incredibly powerful, like inner city old la old single ladies. Right? Just, I'm kind of making this example up as I go along. It's not going real, well, but um, you know, and you're like, well, hang on, I can't just target that because that limits my market. You're like, well, no, no, no. What you're trying to do is generate love. So you want the highest value portion of a market, even if it's 10 people. And if you can create love, you've cracked it because it's much easier to translate that love and, and move it out to different markets and broaden its scope than it is to generate a lot of like. Um, another thing I like to say is um, a lot of companies suffer from um, what I call death of a thousand band-aids. Mm which is just had a death of a thousand cuts, uh, which is they solve a lot of little problems, kind of, and they generate a lot of like, but not a lot of love, and, and uh, it just makes it very difficult to scale. How do you measure love in product? Oh, passion and the response of the user. Um, and and like, like most love, you have to feel it. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's, it's pretty plain when people will, make, will express that. They'll, they'll tell you, right, give them a channel to talk to you. Uh, and they'll just go, yeah, look, I love this. This is awesome. Oh, my God. I wish I had this ages ago. Thanks so much. You know, really appreciate it. How can I help you guys? You know, they're just, they're fawning and they, they love it and they really like it. Like, they'll, they'll tell you, right? And, and um, uh, interesting question, but I don't think I've ever seen a case where it's not obvious. Mm. Right? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to traction, I've, I've launched startups that it just feels like an uphill battle most of the time to get to get anywhere and then I've like with the podcast for example it just took off really really quickly and you could just feel it um, yeah. it's the same thing with product but you know one of the things that you mentioned was the need for focus around a, around a particular area mm. and often you know um, founders have this really big vision for a product that they want to create and it can be really really hard honing in on not just focusing but focusing on the right element of their business how do you, uh, again, any sort of suggestions or things that help you to identify um, what that key area to focus on should be? That's such a good question um, and, and is, is a great challenge. And I, I spend a lot of time doing this um, and working with companies. Um, getting, a, getting a user um, to engage with a product um, is often first just a communications exercise. Which is what do they want and why and how do you how do you connect with them in that and you've got five seconds most of the time, um, but if you think about the full breadth of a product, you really you've got this um, acquisition phase where you're trying to attract someone to be interested, and then you've got um, an engagement phase and a retention phase, um, and and the the value you present, um, uh, if you think about you know what I call value props. Right? Usually you break a product down into a set of value props. And there can be anything like three to, um, if an entrepreneur is left alone too long, they grow right? every month. We usually add another couple. Um, so you talk to an entrepreneur who's been you know, working alone for like 18 months, he's got like 400 value props. <laughs> <coughs> um, you need to get out more. But you usually can, can move those into those groups. You can say, look, that's, that's not going to attract someone initially, but it's f terrific for retention because it you know, um, gets the user to start investing and provides them with a feedback loop and gets them back into the product and um, you know, increases value over time. Right? So you tend to put those value props into these different buckets that um, uh, help you identify um, at what stage you're trying to bring a value prop to bear. Uh, and then in terms of how, how to figure it out, you know, the first exercise is, you know, why would I use this? What problem do I have um, in solving this? Like, what does this solve and why? Uh, and then pretty much, you know, and I'm a real hard ass on this one, which is like, so what? Like, oh, wow, I can, you know, get an Uber that's specialized for my grandmother. Like, so what, dude? Like, why is that special? Um, that, that's one aspect and so that's just an exercise in like you know know really what what do they want and why and start to really drill in on something very simple it's not technical it's just just a problem they have and the circumstances around it um, that's that first bit then another one is um, trend and why now because it helps you understand where a consumer's perspective is at, at you know any given time right um, and how those trends are going to change over time. And it's a terrific input to understanding growth and scale. But, um, you know, trend and really answering the question, why now, is important. Right? 
uh, and often you know not taken too seriously so an example of like uber like why now why did uber happen and it's because i have a gps and a reliable taxi meter in my pocket everybody's got one so they they that was it right that they, they, they just took advantage of the fact that there was a gps and a map and a, a taxi meter and like we can just replace all that stuff now anybody can be a taxi um and you know it kind of went from there right so I think there's the general trends of like mobile accessibility and usage and like obviously in terms of um, uh, you know business right now the move to digitization is is like a tsunami that's slowly happening right and uh, there's just so much opportunity which probably SaaS is one of the big bene um, benefactors of that uh, sorry beneficiaries so you know I think understanding trend and why now is a great input because it gives you a context to understand where, what the customer is thinking about and then you know, often I um, realize that with, with actual testing. It depends on the product, um, but, you know, I would fig we'd figure out, you know, here's the 25 value props. Um, we'd probably buckle those down to about five, really, that people actually, you know, care about. Um, and then go, go do some exercise, go talk to users, um, put up a bunch of Facebook ads, uh, try variations on the ads with wording because you actually have to do marketing in this case, right? Somebody says, oh, well, okay, it's, you know, I'll go back to my bad example again, which is, you know, grandmothers. And so let's go put up some ads and like need a reliable, um, you know, like a value proposition for that might be uh, drivers that will take the time to um, escort your mother into the car, right? And so what's the value prop there, right? It's a fear that something's going to go wrong, that she's going to get lost, that like uh, um, it's reliability, that they're going to show up. Um, it's uh, emergency care on hand, right? So, you know, you can see how that translates to advertising, right? You're like, okay, you know, again, I haven't really thought about this, but, um, you know, Tired, worried that your grandmother may not arrive um, in a dodgy Uber, right? And you're like, oh, okay. So what we're doing in there is, you know, put that out as an ad and test that and see what kind of response you get. And that's, you know, it's not the end end of the world, but usually it gives you uh, a good opportunity to judge where's the pain point, is it there, um, and that actually helps you build your product path a little bit. Yeah. Um, so interested to know uh, your thoughts on uh, a situation where uh, you know every every business has a thesis that it relies on on uh, their view of the world or where they where they think that things are heading. How do you know if uh, the thesis of your business is correct, but you're just reaching the wrong market, or your underlying thesis itself is wrong, and you should so essentially you know when do you decide to pivot or persevere? With a, with a particular idea or a product? Um, God, that's, that's such a hard question. Like it, it, it's so I'm, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you all the hard questions. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, actually, we were making a joke the other day that um, it's a kind of standard practice in America that every time someone asks a question, you go like, you know, from the audience, you always say like, that is such a terrific question, right? Um, I... Um, So, like, I think it, traction is clearly indicated, right? But I don't think it's chance or luck, you know. I think that you, you know, in part need to be able to communicate the pain point and get it in front of people and get it in front of the right people. And often you know straight away if this is working or not working. Uh, and there's a lot you can do to try and manoeuvre around that pain point, but sometimes you just, it's just not painful enough or people just don't care at this point. Um, you know, a business is, is two things. It's, it's both sides of that. It's both, can I attract and build a business today? Not in 12 months, not in five years, but today. But then how does that scale over time and where is that going? And, um, you know, most of the great businesses um, that I've worked with or, or helped out or, you know, just seen, I tend to have that great combination, right? You know, for example, Dropbox. Uh, you know, which Julia was a um, early part of. Um, you know, s had an immediate need, but uh, and solved a real problem, which is you know, hey, people need to share documents between each other. But they solved it in a very specific way in the early days. 
Uh, and then you can just see a part of a trend of this, you know, movement to essentially digitization of business, um, and you know that just led to more and more and more opportunity that you were growing. So, like to answer the question, you know, when do you pivot? Um, within like in two weeks, in the first two weeks, like if you know th- we think this is a pain point, let's go figure that out. Um, yeah. And the problem is that, you know, and I've I've done this so many times. You you think up an idea, you match it to a trend, you think it's a pain point. Uh, and then the engineering cluster mess um, brain explosion happens and you add tons of synergistic features and like, yeah, we'll be able to do this and we can, we can resell advertising data and like, uh, and then like, then your co-founder steps in and like your whole group starts to like build out this, you know, amazing platform and like all this stuff. And, and you've got to go back to all the way down to reality, which is, is that painful? Do people care? don't build anything go find out Mm. Um, and you know at the minimum build something very very simple using as many hack together things as possible to figure that out and my point is um, that often even if you've got a business you've spent a year on even if it's growing okay go back and do that again like go 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 ask those fundamental questions like you know um, it's surprising how many times it isn't actually the pain point, it's that you're not communicating it. Um, so, you know, I, I, would, I would ultimately answer by saying that if, if you haven't got traction in the first, by doing that exercise, um, then pivot and keep pivoting. Absolutely. I, I think what, what you just touched on was essentially just understanding your customers and understanding, like really understanding their pain points. So the big thing for me was the whole Airbnb story of they, they understood the need and it wasn't until I think they they went and started taking the photos themselves and, and understanding that that's actually what was the biggest barrier for people from using their product. Um, you know, it was just something simple. It wasn't that the, that the thesis of their business doesn't work. It's just a, a very small barrier that they had to overcome, but it wasn't you know, if you don't understand your customers and you're just sitting in your room and just thinking about different products and different things, it, it's really hard to, to kind of see that. Yeah, and that's actually, like Airbnb problem is a, is a cool one because um, that's actually kind of an implementation mechanism mm. problem, right? Which is, uh, yeah, I think their relationship with customers is great. And, and you know that they actually did that themselves, right? Yeah. They, they flew out and did that in New York um, with no money. Um, and uh, I think that their, their initial proposition was a really a great one, which is, I want to make money from my spare room. Um, and they obviously had a, a, it was a great opportunity and they, you know, implemented that and executed that incredibly well. And I, I do remember the early days of Airbnb when it was just the three guys, um, you know, and they were, they were pitching a lot of investors um, and angels in the valley. And they got a lot of resistance. I mean... I think they got a lot of no's. I don't know if you know that, but, yeah. but um, based on like, no, I'm going to get raped. Somebody's going to sue me, and like, um, uh, somebody's going to trash my house. This is just crap. No way I'd ever do use this. It's, you know, so um, I think they persevered and did incredibly well. Speaking of um, early stage businesses that have done really well, uh, you were involved with Atlassian at at a relatively early stage as well? Oh, uh, well, I know Mike and um, to a lesser extent, Scott. Actually, I played roller hockey with Mike. Really? Yeah. He used to score him all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, we played in a local Sydney roller hockey league. Wow. And we'd go down and play on, you know, Sunday. It was pretty competitive, actually. We had a fantastic time, right? It was actually a blast to play. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we've known each other for a long time and um, I was running a tech business and so was he and, you know, we... Um, got beers and talked about tech and stuff um, and then actually I was I was lucky enough when I was in the valley I introduced them to um, Excel uh, and I think Mike had been you know talking about how he just didn't want to know about any more VCs and like it's just like it, too many investor opportunities and you know too, too hard to navigate and they're very busy building a business they want to raise money uh, and then um, I introduced them to um, Excel uh, and ultimately, they they took their first investment from those guys. So um, you know, I was I was happy to that I could introduce him to someone that didn't waste his time to an, to an extent that they actually took that money. And you know, I think it was a great decision. I think Excel helped them enormously um, to grow both in the US but also Excel and find great talent. And then ultimately, IPO and you know, they've gone on to build a amazing business now. Right? We we 
you know, we have a juggernaut in Australia and I can't tell you how much of a waterfall that creates in mm. terms of team and talent and people and opportunity. Um, do I think that Atlassian is like an amazing example of, a, of a, the right way to do a startup? Probably not, but mm. you know, they're you know, an incredible company and are contributing so much. Uh, you know, and uh, I think that Mike is a great example of what I call true north, which is he just kind of gets it. It's really obvious. Um, I don't know if you heard him talk, but like that's just really clear, mate. Like why why would we do that? And we're gonna we're gonna execute. And that was my Mike Cannonbrooks impersonation. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and uh, that kind of no bullshit attitude has just um, served them in just so well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, how uh, through Founders founders for Founders, uh, this is almost like a scalable version of what you sort of did for, for Mike and, and Atlassian uh, of, of providing those connections. How important is it for, for founders to have that sort of support system or people that can connect the dots, join the dots or provide introductions? to them uh, enormously beneficial you know I don't I don't um, I don't think there are many companies that have not been built on the great advice of others and uh, I think it's a very interesting as founders is a very interesting opportunity um, because there is such an in, in fantastic network of really talented people but it's still hard to filter and hard to figure out uh, and I think that the Australian marketplace has a little bit of um, self-referential um, vacuum going on. There's, there's uh, kind of people validating each other in, in a way that um, can lead to bad advice. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a challenge. I know it is definitely a challenge and, you know, um, at the forefront for Julia to be able to filter and, and uh, get the right people talking to each other. Um, so I think it, it, you know, speaking to the right entrepreneur, um, and you know, one of one of her things is being able to help an entrepreneur identify the right advice. Uh, but when you when you get that, it just changes everything so fast. Um, so I think that that's the reason that I, that's the reason I'm involved, and that's the reason you know Julie's doing it. And so, I don't know if you met some of the mentors; they're just outstanding, like world class guys. Um, are all super passionate um, about that idea. Actually, this is an interesting thing, um, the story about, you mentioned Chris Saad, uh, and Australian culture, and mentoring, right? I, I think I called Chris Saad in 2006, right? And he was written up in the paper or something, and he was doing some entrepreneurial thing. And I called him up and I went, hey, dude, you don't know me, but, you know, I'm Martin Wells, and I'm, uh, you know, building a tech company, and, God, we should hang out, and you should come down to Sydney and, like, um, and let me know if you've got any questions, I'd love to help you. And like, and he was like, yeah, okay. Like, I don't, excuse me for being blunt here, but like, why are you calling me and what do you want? I'm like, I, I don't want anything. I just want to talk to you about tech. And like, you're, you sound like a smart dude. And like, you know, come down, I got to run an event for tech entrepreneurs and um, let's all get together and let's talk about this. Uh, and I would be happy to help, you know, do anything, right? And I introduced him to people and uh, helped advise on, on um, his product staff and ultimately what became data portability and, uh, and he's gone on to do amazing things and run a platform at Uber and, uh, and yeah, he just couldn't, he didn't understand. He's like, well, why would you do this, right? And Silicon Valley has this amazing culture of pay it forward um, and it always comes back, right? And people, other people are helping you all the time uh, and culturally, it's still a bit weird. It's still a bit like, what, what do you want and why are you doing this, right? And so there's nothing more beneficial for um, all the mentors in the Founders for Founders network to go be able to effectively help someone else because it's going to come back around. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we spoke about uh, with Chris was the abundance mindset. And I think you, you just touched on it. For, I feel like for the longest time people felt like this is my, this is my network. I need to guard it. You yeah. know, um, I need to either get paid or there needs to be something in it for me to actually provide those introductions. And I'm so glad to see that there are so many more people that are willing to to help others and join the dots and, and things like that. And part of it is, you know, things like Founders for Founders as well that just gives access to a huge range of people that, you know, uh, most of the people in the ecosystem wouldn't normally have access to as well. 
You know, I think um, it, it's interesting you mentioned, um, you know, obviously we see a fair bit here of um, pay, pay to raise. Mm. You know, like you talk to someone about, oh, I'm interested in raising money. So you go talk to your accountant or your lawyer, your business mate, and he's got a mate at Macquarie or, you know, something, and, you know, and they offer, you know, three to six percent of money raised. Um, it just would never, ever happen in the value. You'd be crucified for even offering it. It's so bizarre. Mm. Um, because, so I know a bunch of investors, and if I talk to an entrepreneur about his product, and I think it's really good, or I think he'd, you know, mutual benefit from meeting some of the investors, then I'm going to think about who I know, and I'm going to make a referral. And the same with Julia, who obviously, you know, has astonishing access into the valley. Um, they're going to, you're going to get an introduction, right? And you're going to see how it goes, and like get some feedback, and you're going to work together and stay in touch. And you've got this sort of evolving process, um, but it it's enormously beneficial for me to introduce a great company to an investor I have a relationship with. Right? That's a that's a big pay. I don't get paid money, but down the track, um, they're going to take a meeting, or they're going to take a lesser referral, or they're going to support you know another friend of mine in a in a bigger round, or you know I've created a relationship with them. Uh, or I get to participate in investing in another another great business they have, right? And so we just don't have that yet here. Right? Mm. And maybe that's because of the depth and breadth of the um, investment ecosystem. Um, I don't think the communication channels are all that great yet. Um, and I think the angel networks and um, you know some of the the really the bigger VCs, um, certainly uh, Airtree, who are just killing it right now doing amazing amazingly well um, and they're running a really um, great drinks program where they're bringing a lot of entrepreneurs together and they're accessible right they're right there Dan, you know Daniel and Craig and James and John and they're all right there ready to and Alicia sorry Alicia um, ready to engage um, with the founders and give them feedback and talk about stuff um, so I think that you know once that kind of happens um, you know we'll start to see a falling away of this like oh, 5% for raising um, I actually don't, I don't really um, begrudge someone making a commission for doing a bunch of work. Mm. That's not really my problem. Like, that's okay. Like, you know, um, it's that I don't like the reflection on the ecosystem uh, as, that, as, as present status. That, yeah. that's, a, that's a flag. We need to fix that. Yeah. And I think a, a big misconception with, with joining the dots is people think that I have no value to provide to people. So, for example, we recently went through a hiring phase for Playbook Media and we had some incredible people that we interviewed that we just didn't have a position for. And so, instead of just letting them drop by, I knew there were a couple of other companies that were also looking for similar people and right. you, you just joined the dots. And again, it's not, um, you know, for some people that might be, you know, why are you doing that? You're not getting a commission or anything like that. But as you said, it builds value, it builds relationships, it builds trust both for the referrer that you're putting it on, but also the companies and, and yourself as well. So. And it's, and it's, again, hugely beneficial for the ecosystem. And again, just going back to the abundance mindset sort of thing, it's about how do we create that culture where everyone is thinking about how do we grow the pie for everyone versus just yeah. trying to do it for themselves. And there's so many reflections of that. I mean, I would describe that as the currency of Silicon Valley, right? That, I mean, if you, if you want to know how to, to, like in one simple way of like doing well in Silicon Valley or even doing well here in this, in this is help out, do favors, you know, connect people, um, create relationships. Um, it's pretty simple. You know, there's, there's so much to um, the abundance in the valley, right? Because And, and even down starting with an idea, um, you know, that scarcity thing here, I, I still talk to entrepreneurs in Australia where they're like, well, I don't really want to tell you the whole idea right now. And I'm like, well, I want to come around your house and shoot you in the head because <laughs> that is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Or I don't want to go pitch it. So, I, I mean, I get it sometimes. But honestly, everybody's working on the same stuff. Everybody's realizing the same thing. All that matters is execution. Mm. Uh, and you can't execute well um, without getting feedback and mm. getting ideas from people and being able to share that and iterate and make things happen, right? So I, I'm, I'm not saying go crazy and you know, publish your you know, cool idea to the world, um, but don't hold it you know, to your chest. And sort of related to that is you know, there's this... Um, scarcity of ideas that you know people are just not that great at ideation you know, 
they're not that they don't really have the tools and skills um, and I, I do personally want to help out with this like how do you identify trends and opportunities and see where they are because there's there's 20 of them right if, if anybody wants an idea I'm happy to sit down for 10 minutes and give you 50 different things you could work on which are all great and you know, have clear trends and you know, really interesting opportunities and then somebody needs to go do the groundwork to figure out you know what what would a business look like around that but in Australia, you see a little bit too much of that scarcity of like, well, I, found, I finally found an idea, so I'm going to protect it. And nobody, I'm not going to tell anybody, and we need to build it and launch with a big bang because we want to get PR, which is going to get its use. It's never going to work. It's never going to happen. Um, so, you know, I think that abundance, um, you know, um, extends into that as well. Uh, so, so obviously we, we've touched on some of the, the key differences between the Australian and the, and the Silicon Valley ecosystems, but I guess coming back to, to considering the fact that you're now back in Australia and spending, starting to spend a lot more time here, what would you like to see more of in the ecosystem? Uh, all that. Um, and more? Uh, I think <clears throat> uh, a better high quality events um, a lot a, a better ways of the community being able to connect with each other and creating connections um, more of the valley wisdom um, bring, being brought to bear um, not because because they've got a lot of great ideas and a lot of terrific smart people um, who are ha more than happy to share everything um, so, and I think that that will have a great impact. And, and I'm not saying that Silicon Valley is like the mecca and, it, and, and it's the only way to do things. I don't think that's true. I think if you tried to take Silicon Valley's culture you know, as a big block and just stamp it into Australia, it's not going to work. Um, Australia has its own uniqueness and the culture has a lot of great benefits. And we need to figure out you know, what, what does our version of that look like. Um, in, including, you know, our version of scarcity and abundance, uh, and tall, you know, accommodating tall poppy, and um, you know how we approach lifestyle and how we build a business. Um, I don't think you, you don't have to clone Silicon Valley, but there's a lot of great lessons to learn. So I'd like to see that coming a little bit more in. Um, well, what do you think is Australia's unique superpower? Oh, um, the weather, um, <laughs> surfing. Uh, It's a very um, interesting market. It's a, it's a, it has a lot of micro markets that are, you know, large enough to actually do something, um, but small enough to not get crushed. Uh, so I think that we have an incredibly multicultural, broad um, opportunity to embrace many sectors. Um, if, if I had to say, look, where will the, the, where do I think Australia's kind of next big um, unicorns are going to come from, uh, I'd, very, I'd look to Larry Marshall quite a lot. I think it's just stunning technology coming out of CSIRO and, and um, the way that Phil Moore and those guys are working with um, the universities and some of the tech they're exposing. And I think that they're they're the kind of guys who have a great deal of commercialization experience and I'm, I'm really excited with what they're going to be able to do um, so you know I think in terms of superpower I'd say diversity fantastic um, on that note Martin thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experience and insights uh, it's, it's been fantastic for anyone that wants to find out more say hello get in touch what's the best way for them to do that uh, uh, martin.wells at gmail.com martin at foundersforfounders.com um, they can definitely reach out there and, and feel free to say hi or add me on LinkedIn perfect I'll make sure I put those links in the show notes Martin okay. once again thanks for your time you bet man thank Cheers. you Cheers. thanks for listening to episode 74 of the Startup Playbook podcast you can find the show notes of my interview with Martin along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co as always you can join the conversation through our Twitter account the handle is at playbook startup this Thursday, I'll be launching episode 5 of the Startup Playbook Hustle, which will feature Heidi Holmes and Lucy Lloyd, the co-founders of Mentor Loop. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at the next episode.